do something dangerous and share my screen. And then, so I'm just gonna take that over to the side and see if anybody actually joins the Hangout. I can do that. So, mm, can I? I'm not, actually, I'm not sure. If present to yours. I'm seeing it. Okay. You're seeing. So you've got the group chat on. Mm -hmm. And I just want to see your. And I'm seeing your screen. I just want to see that green voice thing go, and it does. Is anybody on there? Mm. Can you can you look at the chat and see if anybody's on? Well, um, wouldn't I need your channel? Yeah, I don't know. I'll just assume they'll start. Hopefully this works. So welcome to the San Diego Tech Immersion Group. We're grateful to have you. Um, my name is Ike Ellis, and this is my business partner. And I think he's my best friend. I don't think I'm his best friend, but. What? Um, <laughs> um, Scott Reed. And we've been, we're, we've been in business for many years, and we've been running the Tech Immersion Group for longer than we've been in business. We've been doing this for like seven years. Seven watching now. Oh, nice. So in addition to the people in the room, we also have people that can hear you online. We have seven people that have joined us on a live stream. 10. Oh, going up. So when you talk over each other, they can't hear. So it's really important to be polite to the people on the live stream that we only talk one at a time. And that when we talk, we talk louder than just the people in the room so that the mic can pick you up. Sometimes the people online will ask us to repeat. So if I stop you and I repeat whatever question that you asked, uh, that's why I'm doing it, just so that we have a good recording. Um, the Tech Immersion Group started those many years ago because of somebody in this room that actually doesn't join us very often. And uh, his name is Andrew Karcher. So Andrew, can you stand up for a second? Andrew's in the back. Say hi, Andrew, so people can hear you. <laughs> yeah. So Andrew came to me and said, we don't really have a beginner user group. And we would like a user group that was more geared toward beginners. Because Andrew ran a very successful user group called the San Diego.net user group. But he was discovering that in his group that has hundreds and hundreds of members that um, he was getting more advanced topics and that the beginners were feeling like they were a little left in the dust, right? So Scott and I decided to kind of take that upon ourselves. And, and Brad. And Brad. And in our thought process, what we thought was, we are all beginners at something, right? So software development and data engineering and mobile development is so wide that we, there were always going to be topics that we weren't very good at, right? <clears throat> so our idea was that we would take one of those topics and stick with it for several months. Rather than like a traditional user group, we'll have a topic for one night. They'll talk about that in detail for three hours, and then they won't bring that topic up for another year or two, right? Our thought was that we were going to take a topic, and we were going to keep talking about it very slowly, more methodically, and maybe more comprehensively for like three to six months, depending on how many people showed up and how interested we were in the topic. So the other thing we thought, we, we, we give talks, by the way, and we watched this happen in talks that we gave, where everybody would be interested for the first hour, and then we would do the last hour, or the last 45 minutes, everybody would zone off, right? So. We thought that that was probably because listening to one person talk for that long wasn't that exciting. So our idea was further that this would be interactive, right? Well, it's really hard to be interactive if we don't have uh, the same source material. So that's how this became a book club. Nerd book club. <laughs> a nerd book club. And I just want to point out, I was looking back at my OneNote, uh, my very first head first C-sharp 
uh, one note was from Thursday, September 16th, 2010. Yeah, eight years. So almost yeah. going on to eight years, yeah. So um, <clears throat> that means that you are not just attendees, that means that you are participants. So we have learned over the years a few things. The first thing that we've learned is when you come to Tech Immersion Group, you actually make a commitment. And that commitment is first and foremost that you will do the reading. So we're going to read this book, R for Data Science. And for those of you who are online looking at my screen, it's this book, um, R for Data Science, right here. And we purposely, because we want you to read with us, we make the reading very small. We used to be aggressive and say, please read 250 pages a month, because we thought we could do that. <laughs> but then nobody did it with us. So we've shrunk it down to about 100 pages a month, which if you, you know, do it regularly, should take you about four to six hours to do. So we're asking for monthly four to six hours of effort. Um, in this month, we're at, we, we'd actually like you to read 111 pages. Well, 110, of, I think, yeah. 110 pages of this oh, book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would have put you over the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Which is basically the first five chapters we'd like you to read. Um, uh, in the next seven days? By our next meeting. Yeah, by our next Right? Meeting. Which is always going to be the fourth Wednesday of the month. Tuesday. 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 Yes. We switched. Yes. We used to be the fourth Wednesday, yes. fourth Tuesday of the month. Yeah. So fourth Tuesday of the month, we will meet February, March, April. We'll set up. We've got all the meetings already set up on meetup.com. So if you think you want to come back, you just have to register when you come back. Okay. So we'll, the first commitment, you'll do the reading, right? The second commitment is that you will ask every single question that occurs to you. So if you have a question, you will ask it. Because remember, the original intention is that this is a beginner place, not a place for us to show off how smart we are, but a place where we can all learn together, right? Um, the third commitment is if you know the answer to somebody's question, that you volunteer the answer, or you do your very best. Because if you teach, you'll actually learn a little bit better. So. Um, we want more interaction between you guys and more interaction between us rather than just Scott and I talking the whole time. So, which we are good at, but he's good at what? <laughs> um, okay. And then, um, that's it. That's really the only commitment that you make that you'll do the reading that you'll, you will ask every question and that you'll answer it if you know it. That's it. Uh, the other thing that will happen is if you don't want to wait for us to meet online or in person, on meetup.com there are discussions that we actually monitor. So if you have a question you immediately want an answer to, please post it to the discussion board on meetup. And, and we purposefully don't jump right on that right away because we like to see other members answering the questions. You know That uh, fosters a sense of community more than us just like answering every question. Plus, we don't really have time. And we also like it when you post your picture there. So that helps us get to know your names and yep. build. We want it to be more than just a one night stand. We want well a, said. We want a relationship that lasts a, at least a few months. It makes us feel good. Yeah. Be respectful of us in our time. Come back again. OK. So um, with that, let me introduce myself. My name is Ike Ellis, and I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. And I'm the co-owner of this company, Crafting Bytes. Um, I wrote a book called Developing Azure Solutions that I just did the second edition of that will be released this month on Amazon. And I speak at past SQL Pass Summit, SQL Bits in London I'll be speaking at next month. And I'll be speaking at um, Redgate SQL in the City next month. <clears throat> and that's about it for me. And then. I'm, by the way, if you're listening online, I'm Ike and I'm the high nasally voice in this. I'm the low manly voice. Yeah, yeah is manly Scott. Voice. Yeah. yeah, that's primarily due to getting over a cold. But uh, um, so my name is Scott Reed. I'm an ex Azure MVP. Um, and uh, 
I he's more of the data arm of the company, and I'm more of the developer arm of the company. Um, and uh, again, we speak at lots of events. I speak more <coughs> like oh. Code Camp type stuff. Speaking yeah, of which, code camp. actually, yeah. Scott and I are going to be the track leaders for all of Code Camp in San Diego. In San Diego, yeah, this that's, July, that's, June that's or nice, July. We uh, haven't decided on yet. too much. But real quick, Code Camp, if you haven't been, there'll be probably maybe 60 sessions of content, all about an hour long, and it's totally free. And Scott and I are going to be deciding who speaks yep. and recruiting speakers. Yes. So Ryan and Phil and Andrew and j Ra and Ben and you, you take bribes. Maybe. You're speaking. You, you, can, <laughs> you can try no, to bribe no, me yeah. to not speak. Uh, yeah, but it's right. happening. You're definitely speaking. Yeah. yeah. Can we get a date? We not don't know yet, one yet. Not, not yet. We're yeah. trying to. They, they negotiate that with UCSD, uh, and that's happening pretty much right now. It should be, yeah, in the next week, I would say. You'll probably hear something. And I didn't forget about Greg and Shashank. All you guys are speaking. So, <laughs> But if you have a topic, we encourage you to speak. And Scott and I have a offer to give you. If you decide that you're passionate enough about R or about something that you want to speak on for Code Camp in June, and you would like us to review your slide deck for content and maybe give you some presentation guidance, Scott and I have both been speaking at many conferences around the world and other teaching opportunities for decades. So we're happy to review your content. And if the topic is interesting enough to us, we're happy to co-present with you. Cool. Um, I don't know about that one. Not all of them. Yeah. We'll see the first couple who ask, but we yeah. might even co-present with you to make that easier if, as an, of an introduction into teaching. Um, all right. So that's enough about TIG. It's enough about yep. us. Let's talk about R. R. So we're going to, we've, we, we took the topics that we wanted to talk about with you in R, and we wrote them all out, but we actually didn't divide them up. So you, we should just do it together? Uh, sure, yeah. OK. What's first on the list? Well, maybe we should define what R is. OK, sure. You take that one. OK, <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's a language. Uh, it is a language, yeah. So there was a proprietary one. language for statistics called S. And S was used by a lot of scientists and statisticians, but it was kind of tied to the direction of a company and individuals that were a little slow moving. So R is more of an open community version of S. And um, that language became very popular. R is very popular among statisticians and among scientists and increasingly among data professionals. So what R does is it makes statistical analysis and statistical visualization and data preparation very easy. And the primary reason why R makes that easy is because the community is very vibrant and they've written and released a wide array of packages that make data uh, data input, data intake easy, data cleaning easy, and statistical analysis really easy. And, and they're very helpful with each other. And most of the reason why they're very helpful with each other is because they all have a job to do, and it's not programming. Like, they're trying to get some other analysis done, and they're using R as a means to get that done. Um, so um, that is R in a nutshell. Um, what, another thing I'll say about R is the tool vendors realize that R has wide adoption. And so R is now easy to integrate with Tableau, right? You can take R visualizations and put it into Tableau, which is kind of known as a data visualization tool. Um, R is easy to integrate with Power BI, which is Microsoft's response to Tableau. Um, R is now part of Microsoft SQL Server. There's a R an engine that allows you to, there's a store, several store procedures that allow you to take um, R code that you've written in another IDE and then uh, save it into um, 
into SQL Server and then use SQL records against whatever our models you've created or um, our, our uh, tooling that you want to run it against. Um, so this is kind of a golden age of R, right? There's a wide audience. The tool vendors have gotten on board. There's a lot of uses for it primarily around statistical analysis. So <clears throat> yeah, that's R. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah. I know my daughter went for an MBA program, and that's what they're teaching for MBA students. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Yep. That's so great. business data analysis. <clears throat> yep. Exactly. Yep. Also, on that note, um, that R has become part of what's called the Microsoft Professional Degree Program. I don't know if you've seen this, but this Microsoft Professional Degree Program is an edX degree. It's not really a degree, but, and they have a lot of different topics like querying with Transact SQL and Excel and Power BI. They have a statistics course, but they also have introduction to R for data science. And they also have- Python. Um, what? <laughs> it <laughs> what? was on there, it was on there. Nobody cares about that. <laughs> um, and they also have uh, programming with R for data science. So. Those two classes on R are part of these 10 classes that earn the certificate. Um, so there's other training, is my point, and there's other kind of certi certificates that you can earn that supposedly have industry credibility. I don't know. I don't know if they do or not, but Microsoft says they do. But. I also read something interesting about Python that many people are using Python to scrub the data to format it and then input into R for the final results. Well, there's a that was one of our topics. I don't know. We should probably talk about it if it's on your mind. But there's this idea of R versus Python. And I don't have a great answer for R versus Python. People, a lot of things that you can do in R, you can also do in Python. And a lot of things you can do in Python, you can also yeah. do in R. And you could talk to different people who will say, I love Python or I love R. But what we think is true, I don't know this is true, but what we think is true is that most data professionals are learning both. And they're learning both for different reasons. So it might be because they like the interface of a tooling with R better. It might be that they like PyCharm or they like a particular Py library better. Like they just, you know, it's like asking a asking a carpenter, does he like his hammer or saw better? I don't know. Yeah. But there's some overlap, but there's also enough difference that it's probably useful to know both. Uh, in the preface of the book, he does say. Um, in this book, we won't learn anything about Python, Julia, or other programming languages useful for data science, implying that both Python and Julia are uh, useful for data science. <laughs> um, and then he also goes on to say, and in practice, most data science teams use a mix of languages, often at least R and Python. Right. Yeah. And I would add SQL to that list, too. I think it would be very hard to be a data professional and not know... So whatever some, flavor, some form whatever of flavor of SQL, SQL you're using for your relational store, whatever rela flavor of SQL you're using for your Hadoop or other MPP products, whatever flavor of SQL that they're using for Google BigQuery, you know, like there's a lot of flavors of SQL out there, and if you know one, you can kind of figure out the others, you know, with some documentation and maybe some guidance, but. Um, so yeah, you need to know those three things probably. And you know what, but in R particularly, and in this book particularly, I would say the most important thing you should know for this to read this book and understand it is actually statistics. Because he immediately starts talking about statistics. Um, he talks about standard deviation and box plots and um, other scatter charts and things like that. And if you understand the statistical reason for those visualizations, it becomes a little easier to understand. The book is very dense. Yes. And the book does not explain the statistical, um, both the statistical um, algorithms and the visualizations that they're choosing to display. So with that, um, I have some recommendations on how to augment the book if you're a little, you know, like me, a little thin on statistics, maybe the little you did know you forgot. So if you're like me and you want some help, 
I have a couple of recommendations. Can I talk about Yeah, this go now? for it, go for it. And then I'll turn it over to you. You no. can talk about tooling and Jupyter. Go for okay. it, yeah. All right, the first thing is this guy, Paul, has Paul's online math notes. I don't know who Paul is, but he <laughs> did some but great- he writes some darn good notes. He writes some good <laughs> notes, yeah. So if you have some math issue that you think uh, you can't remember, this is a good place to kind of look at what, what's available here, okay? And then he's got these you know, PDFs you can look at. The next thing I would look at is just, I know it sounds silly, but on YouTube, like if I said standard deviation, what is standard deviation, right? And it says standard deviation explained and visualized. And the guy, Yao Ming, all just these like, questions can be answered using the concept of standard deviation. Right. So we're not going to talk about that for three and a half minutes, but just watch a quick YouTube video might get you over the hump on what the author is talking about. Um, the other thing I would recommend is in this, um, this course that I showed you, remember I showed you, boop, right? And I showed you this track. They have a basic Excel course, but they also have essential statistics for data analysis using Excel. And that's this course here, essential statistics. Now, look, just to kind of show you this, by the way, because I don't, you're not going to want to dedicate a lot of time to a whole new course. Um, I just want to show you a little bit about the course. It is only two to four hours a week for six weeks. So it's basically 12 to 24 hours of work. It's not, I'm not, this isn't a big college course that's going to take you all semester, right? It's just a dozen hours, a couple dozen hours, right? And the way this course is broken up, if I showed you this, let's go histograms. And skewness. Which go together. That's, that's a good word. Skew, right skew. Skewness. Skew follows the tail. See, I'm a genius. All right, so if you look at this videos, you'll see her, and she does a good job of explaining the math concept, the statistic concept. And then there's another old guy. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he's great. And he talks about doing it in Excel. So she introduces the topic, and then the Excel answer. And then the book will tell you the R answer for doing the exact same thing, right? So that this course is free. You can go join this course right now, right today, and sign up. I would have said oh. $99. Well, if you want the certificate, it's $99. Uh, yeah. But if you just want to audit the course, you can do it for free. Cool. Yeah. And we will put a link to this in our meetup notes so that you can have the link. And we'll put a link to Paul's online notes. Do we need a link to YouTube? No. no. Okay. And then the Khan Academy, I'm sure you guys have heard of, but um, he started up Khan Academy by doing math. And his course catalog is very math heavy. And he, you know there is a statistics course here. Well, actually, not a course. It's just a ton of videos. So his explanations are pretty good. Oh, well, there, there are a lot of Khan Academy instructors, yeah. and, like mean, median, and mode, right? Yeah. OK, so you could do that. And then the last thing I will say is MIT OpenCourseWare. Um, they have all of the books, videos, and notes for MIT online and there are statistic courses here it's a little more you have to be more dedicated because it's in larger chunks but that could also help you so the whole point of me talking about this is this the book is dense and if there's a vocabulary word that you don't feel like they explained well that will happen to you because it happened to me happened to scott happens to everybody so it's OK to say, you're not an idiot if you don't understand it. right? Just go online, look at those other resources. You'll find the answer. Post to the meetup. You'll find an answer on the meetup. Or maybe we'll respond with a video that might explain it better than we can. right? And then just plow through and go to the next topic. right? Does that make sense? Sound like a good deal? Because some of it is a little complicated. Andrew. I was just going to say, the one thing that I've 
found as you start getting into more of these is not necessarily not all the time having to need to understand the math behind some of these algorithms, but understanding why you would use it, what problem it's aimed at solving, um, and what kind of data you need to input and what kind of data you're going to need to solve them. Yeah, that's another thing they don't do a good job explaining is yeah. why. So sometimes, yeah, going online or asking to know why we do it would be a really good thing. The thing I'll add to that is, if you haven't taken a math class lately, you're in good company. But to remind you, math is largely a vocabulary of made up words that then have a definition that everyone agrees on, right? So um, understanding vocabulary, uh, you might never know why, you know, exactly the full history of a vocabulary word. But yeah, like Andrew said, understanding the agreed upon concept that we all have assigned to this vocabulary word, and then when it's used is more important than understanding every little nuanced piece about it, or, or even exactly how to read, you know, whatever, you know, lambda or... Eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Right, exactly. That's just what popped into my head, I don't know. Right, exactly. All right. OK, so that's how to learn. And now I'm going to hand it over to Scott. I'm to, talking about tooling, yeah? To talk about tooling. And okay. I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then I'm going to hand it and let you present to everyone. I am presenting to everyone. And now you need to share your screen. Yep. Share my entire screen. OK, and now I have the infinity. Yep, see okay. the infinity? OK. All right, so everybody's seeing that. Yeah, And then I'm cool. going to just zoom in a little. OK. So that, wait, before we do that, mm -hmm. can you guys see Scott's screen? OK. You can see that. Mm -hmm. Can you see that OK? Yeah. OK, did this anybody actually be... chat online? Can um, you guys see Scott's screen? is Google search. Anybody chatting? Did anybody ever actually ask a question online? Mm -mm. No. I didn't. I don't know if that we even can works. See. We okay. can see. OK. Okay. Oh, you see that? Yeah, live what? chat, Melissa. Oh, Melissa shit. just said I, we can see. Oh. OK. So. Um, and uh, this first part is covered in the preface, right? So don't think you have to write all of this down. But um, the first thing you're going to need to uh, work with R is R itself, um, which you can get from the comprehensive R archive network. Um, and there are downloads for the th oh, sorry, sorry. three operating systems that you might have there. Uh, and then uh, most people that work with R use R Studio, which is um, just another quick Google search away. Um, R Studio looks like this, although this is blown up quite a bit. And it basically has a console, which is like a REPL in other languages, a read, evaluate, print loop. Um, so uh, it has a prompt down there at the bottom, and I can type, you know, uh, one plus two, and it tells me the answer. Um, and um, uh, as I type commands, it gives me the feedback. But also over here on the right, notice that there's a section called plots. And as you perform graphing functions, which is a very common thing to do in R, that's where those will go. Um, so R Studio is um, what he uses throughout the book here. I, I just want to throw out one other option, which he doesn't really mention, but is um, uh, something that I use when I'm digging into data, when I'm exploring data, because our studio, I mean, I could save um, you know, what I've typed here, but um, often I want to make notes to myself, et cetera. And there is a concept that started off in Python called the Python Notebook. Um, and uh, it was eventually standardized, and now it's just called a Jupyter Notebook, but Jupyter is spelled with a Y instead of an I. Um, and the Jupyter Notebook, it comes with a standard Python kernel, but you can install a R kernel. Um, 
And the way that works is once you have it installed on your system, you will type Jupyter space notebook and you'll hit enter. And wherever you've typed that, it's gonna use that directory. And you can, uh, let's see where I put it, this one. Yeah. Uh, and so you'd see something that looked like this, right? I've given it a specific note, uh, directory on my machine and all of the files that I've created would be visualized here. And I can click in these. Um, and then I can say, I want to create a new notebook. And as I mentioned, the standard kernel, hi, welcome. Uh, the standard kernel is Python, um, but you can install a R kernel. And this will allow you to create a new R notebook. And basically, um, in uh, the way Jupyter works is you input commands here, and it's going to record the output as well. And when you save the notebook, it will show the output as well as the input. And uh, uh, you can also write, so this little block here that's covered in green is called a cell. And you can have uh, code cells where you type R commands, um, and it shows you the output. But you can also have uh, comment cells or markdown cells or notes cells. So it's more like a scientific notebook where you are uh, recording your interactions with the data so that you can look at them later, right? So I could come back and I could say, oh, well, here was my R chapter one, right? So I started in this book and I did the library and I typed what he told me to type was his MPG and it outputted a number of uh, rows uh, and columns from that, but it didn't tell me the total number of rows and columns, which I thought was weird because that's what, if I had done that in Python, pers I think it would have done that. Uh, um, yeah, at the bottom of the Python one, it tells me 231, 234 rows and 11 columns. And so I was like, why? But it actually is much easier. Because then I was like, OK, well, I can figure out how to do it in Python. But let me go back to R. It's actually easier to do it in R. It's just dim. Give me the dimensions of this thing, right? So um, anyway, so it gives me a chance to like record what I was doing as I was digging through the data and write it down in a notebook that I could send to somebody else and say, here, this may help you. These are my notes as I was digging through this data. Um, it's just a different way. It's like more of a uh, recording rather than a throwaway. Okay, that's Python. Uh, I mean, sorry, that's uh, Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, there's one other thing, which is it doesn't explain to you how to get the R kernel. And that was one thing that I found when I was going through that was a little bit confusing. So if you do a Google search for Jupyter kernels, um, these are all of the language, or you can just say Jupyter languages. These are all of the languages that are supported either by Jupyter, the project, or by other third parties. And the one that you are looking for, for R, is called the IR kernel. It is not infrared, like you might be thinking. It is R, IR kernel. Um, and it was weird because it says IPython3, and then it has an R. It just didn't look at all right to me. But that is the right one. That's the one I've installed that let me do R. So that's what you need. But Look. Jupyter was also for sharing with colleagues right. so that you could interact. Send, send the notebook file. So just like you would a scientific notebook where you're taking notes about your experiment, and then you might share your notebook with a colleague. This is just a digital form of that. I am doing experiments with this data. I am <clears> taking notes as I am doing it and then I'm going to hand this off to somebody else. Or So the final thing about Scott's not just showing Jupiter because he thought it was cool. Although I am. It's actually <laughs> widely used in both the R and Python and even regular just data communities. So knowing Jupiter, like people pass these notebooks back and forth to each other all the time. They use it as a means of collaboration. It's 
I don't know if it's ubiquitous, but it is widely used all over the place. And people it will, you know, reference it all the time. So you'll see it referenced all the time. But yep, it is a good resource. Um, in terms of tooling, that's R, R Studio, and Jupyter. That's all I got. Anything else? Well, Gordon has joined us online, and he asked me to show our integration with SQL Server at a later meeting. Uh, but I can just show Gordon. No one else wants to see it. But by show of hands, <laughs> who would like to see how R works with Microsoft SQL Server? Oh, well, all right. So we'll, we'll show it next month then. Um, OK. Uh, what's next on our agenda? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah. There's one other thing that I did want to we only have one other thing, actually. So, but you can do it, so I don't have to share. Um, if you go to Quizlet.com, mm -hmm. so how much reading are you going to do? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then I'm going to make a Quizlet for next month on those 110 pages. So this is a flashcard app that lets us ask questions. Scott and I will make it. And and we've, uh, if you've been at TIG in the past, we did this one for, um, we did this for the JavaScript track pretty heavily because there was a yeah. lot of material there. Right, so this is similarly dense. So we're going to quiz you guys mm -hmm. and yeah. So get familiar with this because you're gonna be seeing it. Um, in fact, I probably still, uh, I don't know. Um, what's anything else? Yeah, well, you don't have can you don't have the Kindle version of this, do you? Nope. You don't? OK. But I can flip back over to you. Yeah, why don't we do that? Question? Yeah. yeah. Um, is it better to bring a laptop to these sessions? It is. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, we found that the people who um, the people who bring laptops like to show code. So sometimes, and we've done that before, where people who uh, can you see my screen, by the way? Um, uh, it just says, "Oh no, I no." Okay, let's see. Yes, now, yes. Okay, and then can you see that? Uh huh. Okay, great. So we have found that people who bring laptops like to share what they did. And we've given them the cord to share. So, or if you give us the code beforehand, we can show. But sometimes the other thing we found is that, look, I'm pretty verbose. Everyone agrees. <laughs> I, I talk a lot. But when talking about math and sometimes programming, you just kind of stutter until you can see it, right? So yeah, bring your laptop, because sometimes you have a question that's difficult to articulate. Like, what's that line doing, right? And then you're going to read a line off. Like, no one's <laughs> going to remember that, right? But if you can show it, and then we're like, how does that work? Oh, now I understand what the problem is, right? Um, so yeah, I think you should bring your laptop if you can. Yeah, especially if you, required. Have, yeah, if you have questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like certainly come with, you know, and especially if they're related to some piece of code, absolutely bring your laptop. That way you can. The, the other thing that we've done in past tracks that we haven't discussed doing in this track, but maybe we will, is a final project for the last session. So what we'll do is say, here's a problem. Let's solve it in R. And what we've learned in doing this in past tracks is Programming languages are funny things. Nobody ever solves the same problem the same way. So you just learn a lot of different ways of solving the same thing. Um, and then we can argue argue which one's better. Um, OK, so if we talk about what we're asking you to read, I don't know why. Here we go. So the preface is good. We've covered a lot of the preface already. Um, a lot of the book uses a package that you'll have to install right away called Tidyverse. And probably one of the most popular things to do in R is to use ggplot2. And you're going to be doing a lot of that right off the bat. So um, you'll install Tidyverse and use ggplot2 a lot. 
Um, and then the book is separated into five sections. And the first section is called Explore. And the second section is called Wrangle. And the third section is called, did I miss it? Nope, it is boop, it's just, boop. It's just third a program. A, yeah. Yeah, it's just a right. long, that part two, the Wrangle is long. Yeah, it's long. Yeah. So roughly our months are going to coincide with those parts. So this first part of explore, we're going to explore both the language of R and we're going to explore some data. And what we've learned is, and they don't really do a good job of explaining this in the book, but he showed you the data frame MPG. He showed, uh, Scott did. You're going to take that data and you're going to visualize it in a lot of different ways, which kind of makes sense. You're going to explore it to see what is in there. And, you know, how we can present it in a way that makes sense, right? So you're by looking at those basic visualizations, then you're going to look at some workflow. Then you're, we're going to look at um, actually doing a little bit of data transformation with another um, library, and then um, look at creating scripts. And then after that, you're going to stop basically at the end of chapter five. Should we make them do chapter six too? How big is chapter six, actually? Tiny. Like we can a couple. Do that. OK, maybe we'll do all of part one, explore, um, and then we'll do wrangle next. Just time. keeps going up. The requirement <laughs> yep. just keeps going up. All right, yep. let, me, let me see where that is. Yep. Oh, yeah, it's nothing, actually. Yeah, there we go. So you guys can do it. You can do all of part one. 16 pages. Oh, oh. we're taskmasters. Yeah. Question. Yeah. The, the book that you chose? Did you consider other ones too, or um, was it like we like O'Reilly books? They, no, you know, that isn't. So <laughs> no, that's definitely not the case. <laughs> right. So how many of you are longtime book readers with TIG? How many of you have been to other tracks? So yeah, and then so th that's not very many. So we um, usually vote on the book. Uh, and usually we vote on the topic because we like to keep a relationship with the, the people who are here. So we would say it by the time this track started winding down, we would say, Scott and I are interested in these three topics by a show of hands. What do you guys want to learn? Right. And then you would choke. And then we would have an online discussion saying, we're thinking about this book. What do you guys think? But in this case, you know, when Rome was under threat, they appointed a dictator. And that was me. <laughs> so um, I just made the decision. And in large part, Scott didn't want to do R. That's so true. So um, <laughs> Scott felt like Python was comprehensive enough. And we already did Python for data science. And I argued, Scott, we should do R because it's very, very popular. and. Uh, you should, and you should know it, right? I was pointing to him. So he's like, well, I want to do this other topic. And I said, well, then do you want to lead the track? And he's like, no, you pick the topic, <laughs> you, you lead the track. So that's how that, uh, I became the dictator because he didn't want to do it. So um, I chose the book because um, I didn't want to do an introduction class because R isn't that complicated with language constructs. It's not that would be like a one month topic, you know? So I actually wanted something that was a little more difficult to get into off the bat. And that had a little more substance so that we could carry it through other tracks. So I looked at like four different books. This one was highly reviewed on Amazon. I, I bought, I actually bought four different books. And then this is the one I thought had enough to talk about for four or five months. So, uh, that being said, was there another book that someone was gonna recommend? Um, you asked the question. I was just curious. Uh, no, I was just, I was just curious um, why you thought it was a good book for yeah. so reviews and looking at the other ones. It just seemed to make more sense. Yeah, yeah, it did. And we've actually Scott and I've explored, and Brad, who we miss, um, yeah. have explored other ways of learning. So in the past, we've done we've, we we actually one track 
for mobile development, we wrote an online course mm -hmm. that we had everybody do a Xamarin course with us. That was so much work, it was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, we'll never do that again. <laughs> yeah, and we didn't really feel like we got enough praise for that. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, the, the, another thing we've done is a bunch of, um, what were the, what, what, what was it called? Damn, what was that? Oh, for exorcism? Exorcisms? Yeah, yeah, yeah exorcism, yeah, yeah I.O. Yeah. I wonder if, oh, God, I didn't even look about yeah, that. I wonder if there's an R for uh, exorcism for R. So do you know exorcism? Have you seen this? So exorcism throws up a problem, very basic problem, and then they have you solve it in a new language, and you solve it, and you post it, and then very nice people tell you why you're wrong. And... <laughs> Or, or a better way to do it. Yep, and they, uh, it's it's on there. Okay, it only it only has thirty problems, but it's on there. So we did exorcism. We did Python exorcism. Yep, we did Python exorcism. Yep. And we, we may have done a little bit of C sharp exorcism too. Yeah. So there's another. One. This is, might be a good thing, by the way, because one, they have you working in it and thinking about it really early, um, and two, the people that volunteer their time to show you a different way are very knowledgeable and nice and they do it for free. So that's a good thing to have. But so let me show you, by the way, online. So here's exorcism. And they do, uh, and if you go to languages. forward slash languages, yeah, yeah. And then, um, so have, they have R, it has 30 problems. Yep. I was just noticing Julia also has 33 problems. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and I think the other, if anybody does Arch SIG, um, we did some exorcisms for architecture SIG. For Scala. Or for... Yeah, we did Erlang, we did Ruby, and we did Scala. Yeah. So anyway, we might do this next month. Yeah. I think we're going to do this next month. Yeah, we'll do this together yeah. and embarrass ourselves together next month. Yep. All right. But for you guys, just read the... Just read the first part of the book. OK. Last thing, um, our meetings are normally 90 minutes to two hours. So we start at 6, and we end somewhere in the 8 range. But the first meeting is always brief, because we're just introducing the topic and assigning homework. Well, actually, so we did switch, and we may switch after this one, to um, to rather than waste burning a meeting, basically going over the topic, we did a introduction video. Yeah, a video, a YouTube video of the topic sort of ahead of time so that you could just watch that and you'd be sort of caught up. Um, we thought we'd do an introduction in person this time. Because, because it's it, been a long time. It's been too long. And yeah. because you're new, a lot of people are new. So yeah. that's why we did it this way. Um, typically, half of you don't come back. And I think that happens because you didn't get around to reading the homework. Um, in fact, I know that because we've asked people, and they say it was too hard to read the whole Although, book. I got too busy. Got uh, too busy. Of the people that come back, only about half have finished it. Right? <laughs> finished really? it yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like yeah. they've all at least done some, but like only about half of it. So this is kind of like tryouts where you get to decide if you make the cut. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see who comes back. We'll see who reads the homework. Yeah. We'll but be... even if you don't read all 100 and now 16 pages, um, you know, come back. It's It's, you know, it's informative. Um, yeah, come back for the argument, because invariably in a track, Scott and I will get super pissed at each other. Yes. <laughs> so um, we come back to watch the show. Maybe maybe, maybe one day it'll come to blows. Yeah. And only if we're lucky. Yeah. It'll be over the Python R scheme of uh, no, the schism. Won't. That's all done. <laughs> you can't even agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe it'll be over what argument we're going to have. Yeah. We miss Brad because Brad was good for arguing because he was a very, very staunch opinion yeah. person. But opinion. He, I just, he's too far to go. Yeah, yeah, he's in Carl's, but he's in his pajamas right now. Yeah. It's too much. He's probably not even listening to us. Yeah. Okay. So that's all we have for today. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so, a uh, uh, helpful tip maybe for people? Is that okay to share? Sure. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, so I started using R. And uh, one of the things that at first really confused me was 
what is the statement terminator in R? Okay, so in C, it's a semicolon, and R allows semicolons, and in Python, pretty much carriage turn, right? And yeah. R uses carriage turns. Wasn't clear at first to me what's what. So from what I've learned, I'm still a beginner. Uh, if you want to include multiple statements on the same line, which nobody recommends, you can slap semicolons in there like C. Mm. If R sees a carriage return, it's going to try to interpret whatever you've had on that line so far. So there's actually a huge difference between saying X gets two carriage return plus three versus X gets two plus carriage return three. So if you put the plus at the end of the line, R will know it's an incomplete statement and it will look to the next line for additional input. But if you do two carriage return plus three, it's going to say X gets two and assign two to the variable. And then you'll get a syntax error when you see plus three. So that was like really kind of mystifying for me when I was first. I don't think it'll probably come up in the early exercises, but if anybody has like a narrow screen and likes to hit character, <laughs> it's like really going to mess you up if you don't know that. As soon yeah. as you hit return, R is going to try to see if it's a complete statement. In With the way we have to run this for the screencasting, that will definitely come up. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Or One thing that we have done in past is um, just asked you, is there anything you wanted us to cover that we haven't mentioned we're going to cover? Or did you you sat down today and you're like, oh, I can't wait till we talk about this. If if that's true, we would like to know whatever that is. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm going to show R and SQL Server mm -hmm. in addition. We're going to do Exorcism IO in addition, mm -hmm. and I'll probably show either R in Tableau or R in Power BI in addition. Um, so so coming out of reading the book, what 116 pages, and and knowing that we want to have it be interactive and that I'm a first timer with this too, like, like any other, like what are, what are we bringing to the table? At so that next meeting, so the as course? you're going through the book, right, you're going to come across stuff that big WTF moments for you. Um, and whatever yours are, they may differ from mine and Ike's, but just note them. And then uh, we'll kind of in the next meeting, take the first part of the meeting to kind of go through the book in order. And when you get to your WTF moment, you need to bring that up, ask a question about it, explain your confusion. <laughs> we'll hopefully clarify the confusion. And maybe somebody else was confused as well, but just kind of glossed over it. And and the fact that you're bringing it up will help the whole Yeah, group. it's important to note that Scott and I are not experts in R. No. We, we chose this topic because we were interested in it. Um, I chose in fact, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I will say this. We always choose a topic that we want to learn because we never know who's going to show up. So um, we're like, well, if it's just you and I reading something together, yeah, we've done that for years, yeah, and we've always had fun doing that. So you know, maybe other people will like to join us in that, right? Yeah. So um, every time we've taught something, or every time we've done something in TIG, with a couple exceptions, like we knew JavaScript, we knew. You yeah, T SQL windowing functions. We knew yeah, entity yeah. framework. So, so like, yeah, you, you them, knew T SQL. I knew entity framework. Yeah, yeah. Mobile. There okay, was some yeah. learning. There was some. You know, we knew. But it always surprises us how often we start a track, and we end up getting a project from someone not here. Somebody says, like, a month from now, do you guys have any experience in R? We've got a project, and we're like, actually. Yes, we're, we do. We're freaking experts now. <laughs> <laughs> We've read a book. Yeah. So we know all about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm we always looking. go a month ahead of you guys, by the way. We've already read the reading. Uh, not all of it. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> just I'm I'm on page fifty or so. Wait, yeah. then only one of you should have showed up. Uh, <laughs> right. If if I didn't have Scott, I don't know what I'd do. It's been my life writing his coattails. Um, yeah. If I didn't have Ike, this would be a very boring meeting. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, it'd be a Python meeting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it'd be in a different topic. Yeah. But that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you forced me to learn this language. It's good. 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 Um, yeah, I was just looking at some of the stuff that we've done in the past. Um, you know, it's a lot of web stuff. Um, so this is a good foray into something that is not in the web space. Yep. So Scott, uh, you said R is not your selection. Uh, apparently, I you chose that one mm -hmm. as the dictator of the month. So what would you choose, Scott? Uh, well, um, when we have voted in the past, um, we normally throw up a bunch of topics, mm -hmm. and we have people you know vote either virtually, online, or in person. Um, and the last time that happened, um, we had uh, proposed topics that were, um, you know, that I was interested in. Yeah. So uh, React Native was one. Um, more web stuff. Yeah. Uh, Meteor. More web stuff. Uh, well, React Native is more uh, mobile. Space. Oh, yeah. 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 I was uh, about React. Yeah, Meteor is definitely me Meteor with Mongo. So, like, uh, um, for more of a like a web socket based app, um, and then you wanted to do Docker and Kubernetes. I did. Yeah. That was probably which we uh, might do Docker and Kubernetes next, but, yeah. or at least make that. Yeah, we, we had when we went with the uh, Linux track. The reason why we went with that Linux track is because we felt like. We would learn Linux first. We would do something else, and then we would come back and do Docker. Docker, um, you know, as sort of a follow-on, help people cement their knowledge, and uh, you know, maybe even show some of the. Um, Docker you know, is increasingly like, being used in in data projects because it's how people are experimenting and then lifting to the cloud, trying to scale to the cloud. So it's a uh, not just that Docker is not just a web topic or a mobile topic. That's a everyone who wants to easily deliver whatever project they're working on into the cloud is. It's how to solve the continuous delivery is hard problem. Mm, right. Yes. One thing that might be interesting if people are interested in it is looking at Shiny. Again. So mm, shiny. Server or displaying bar notebooks on in a kind of like a portal mm. go to to look at uh, diagrams. I feel like it was mentioned in here somewhere. And I just looked it up in the index. Uh, I was going to say, I was going to learn Shiny a little bit. Shiny is a JavaScript framework in the front end for the R action. You can display some data. Uh, so it, it might be worthwhile to pay attention and be close with it. Sounds good to me. Yeah. We could do it. So it is. Is that, a, is that a, is that a, is that a something? No, nope, I don't think so. No, no. There it is. Our studio guys actually developed it. Yeah. Oh, it's on the last page. Well, it's it's in like the appendix or whatever. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we can. Made by R Studio, as mentioned. Yeah. Take a look. Maybe we can show some shiny. It's a good way to like in ProSight. Somebody puts together an R notebook, and they want to push that or that out to everybody. They want to be a play with that and slide it. And they push it shiny, and then people can interact with it, play around with it, get look at the data as it was that was developed, without having Jupyter or R Studio on their desktop. Gotcha. Got it. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. By the way, this a totally different topic, but. Um, Andrew runs a group that meets on the first Tuesday of the month. Wednesday? Is it Wednesday? 
I'm talking, oh, Wednesday, the data, data engineering. engineering is first there we go. So data engineering is first Wednesday. At the moment, it's downtown. It's actually at the Plural Site office about half a mile from here. Um, and uh, it was really good. He's only he's had two meetings so far. He's going to have a third. So um, if you're interested in data and you're interested in R and you want to learn, you want to meet other data professionals, that is a very informal group where they kind of, the members also interact and participate a lot and even deliver content there. So it's a pretty good group. And then um, that's actually where a couple of people here and I met. Um, and then Phil in the back, Phil runs the SQL Server user group, which meets on some Thursday, the third <laughs> Thursday? No. Is it the second Thursday you guys meet? Third Thursday for the SQL group and the BI groups the first Thursday. There we go. First and third Thursday, yep. And they meet, well, at least the SQL group meets um, up off of Mir Mesa Boulevard, um, in between Miramar Road and Mir Mesa Boulevard. But that's it, guys. So we got. Oh, you've got something else before uh, we go? Well, just another topic. Uh, I don't know anything about it, but I've heard of R Markdown as an alternative to Jupyter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's worth considering or not. So. We'll show it. Yep. That's also mentioned in here. I, I was just seeing that as I was looking at Shiny. Except for I was distracted because it was Shiny. <laughs> <laughs> I got something just for, for maybe some context that, that, that might be interesting is. I get the impression that R is for academic use, and that's where it's widely used. And some of the examples that we talked about in the beginning were that way. Um, do people here know of some good commercial or you know the production type of use cases within an enterprise environment, or corporate environment, or business use case, and where it's being used maybe by colleagues or other departments where you work, or uh, interesting projects that are you know in that space rather than in the university uh, education space? Well, the, uh, the strength of our, I, I'll answer for you. Actually, I, I was want gonna, to. I, I, was saw, gonna I saw some other people raise their hand. Sure. I was going to say, maybe, what do you got in yeah, there? Yeah, I mean, side, our data science teams, all, they all use R. I mean, they, they use Python as well, Figured. But, and, and SQL, but I mean, R is the, the primary language that they do the majority of their Kind of data exploration in. Um, they do some Python for sometimes running models uh, against larger sets of data or when they need to do it programmatically, uh, things like that. But for the most part, I don't think you could be a data scientist in a company, maybe, if, maybe unless they have SAS, but um, that you can't get, be a data scientist without a known R. Yeah, I was at a medical device company today that I'm not allowed to. My clients don't like it when I mention them on YouTube that I'm that they're my client. So um, one of my clients today, they produce a device, which is about as much as I can say, and they're concerned about the efficiency of both the device and the manufacturing process to make the device, and they do most of their work in R and they say almost immediately after you'd start doing work with them that they improved a very particular process that they do from about a 70% efficiency rate to about a 99.99% efficiency rate solely because of the strength of their data scientists in R. Um, so whatever they figured out, they did it in R. Um, and they made a ton of money doing it. Uh, was there another? I felt like there was somebody else. Oh. Um, they're doing a lot of scientific <coughs> advancements for, towards this product that they're going to put out. Pretty much all of that discovery and learning is done. And then they're building algorithms in Python based on what they learn. <coughs> analysis in the lab. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah, going kind once. Of uh, okay. You know, 
party on it. <laughs> party on. <laughs> party on it. Oh, okay. Sweet. All right. Thank yeah. You. See you guys. Yeah. We'll see. Track was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> that was made it all worth it, right? <laughs> that was great. Okay. Yeah, he has to go up north. Yeah. So, just so you know, um, our next meeting, you can sign up for now. Um, is already up and it is boop, boop, boop. Where is it? February 27th. Is that right? Did we do that math right? So, yep, yes. February 27th. Seven of us are going, but hopefully you'll RSVP and make it next month after 116 pages. Yep. Cool. Thanks, Miss. Grab yeah, pizza. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>